Peace agreements that consider women's voices and the perspectives of civil society are 64% more likely to succeed. In some ways, that's an astonishing statistic, but it also makes perfect intuitive sense. So, with so many ongoing global conflicts in Ukraine, Afghanistan, Sudan, and Myanmar, to name a few, it's in everyone's best interest to engage women, meaningfully. And our next two speakers are doing exactly that. To date, the UN's $90 million Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund has supported more than 450 grassroots civil society organizations in 26 crisis-affected countries. Our first guest heads it up. Here's Ita el -Kiari. And our second speaker is the executive director of the Gaston Z. Ortigas Peace Institute, which focuses on women's engagement with peace and security in the Philippines. Welcome, Karen Tenyada. Thank you both for joining us for this In Conversation session, Building Sustainable Peace. Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining our conversation at this year's uh, SDG Action Zone. We are very happy to be uh, here with you today. My name is Drita al -Khiyari. I'm the head of the Secretariat of the United Nations Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund. And today I have the great pleasure to introduce and welcome a very special guest, uh, Karen Tanyada, the Executive Director of the Ortigas Peace Institute, and a civil society partner of the fund uh, in the Philippines. Karen, welcome, and thank you again for being here. Um, I'd like to begin by asking you a little bit about yourself. Can you tell us how you got you get started in this work and what uh, does your organization do in the Philippines to help build sustainable and inclusive peace? Yes, um, well, I started as a student activist in the 70s, a long time ago and was active also in the anti-dictatorship movement. And you may know that in the Philippines, this caused a greater conflict, two major conflicts, one with a communist group and another with a Bangsamoro struggle for self-determination. But we were able to end after many years, the dictatorship through a peaceful people power. And after that, we felt that citizen civil society must be involved in the peace processes. So my NGO uh, continues this work of supporting uh, citizen civil society action to be involved and in not just government and the armed groups. Um, we also were feminists in the social movement. So we started to be involved, including with uh, lobbying for the gender equality provision in the constitution after the democracy. And many years later, uh, we helped to put in the National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security in the Philippines. So NGOs were very active there, working with uh, the government, the, the National Machinery, and the Peace Office. And at this time, uh, we're already trying to draft the fourth National Action Plan for the coming year. So that's our work. And I'm happy to let you know that it's the Women Peace Humanitarian Fund, which is uh, supporting our efforts this year in uh, consulting women civil society so that their agenda will surely be in this new national action plan. So we're very grateful and fortunate about this. So I'd like to ask you, Rita, especially to know more about the, the Women Peace Humanitarian Fund, uh, what is the history of how it was set up and how does it help uh, women's organizations like mine? Yeah, thank you so much, Karen. And thank you so, thank you for sharing. Um, you really very eloquently uh, brought to life those uh, very concrete and compelling examples. And uh, these are exactly the type of, uh, of support that the fund provides throughout the world. I mean, as you know, women's civil society organizations like the one that you lead, uh, are so often the first in their communities to advance equality, to mobilize for sustainable peace. Uh, they are the ones who translate uh, policies into concrete and meaningful change that transforms lives. Uh, plus, um, and you know this more than anybody, it is local women's organizations who are so often best placed to reach out uh, and work with the most marginalized populations and to include them in conflict prevention, humanitarian response, ending sexual and gender-based violence, or even building back better from a global pandemic such as the, the COVID-19. 
Um, so for us, I think we were built on the analysis and the knowledge that local civil society organizations are instrumental to building a more peaceful and equal future, but for everyone. And uh, despite this, and, and you know this as well, uh, support for local women's organizations in crisis so uh, context has been uh, very, very low. Uh, and in fact, the women's organizations receive less than 1% of the money that goes to fragile context uh, overall globally. Uh, and this is exactly why the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund was launched back in 2016, so a pretty recent uh, fund and initiative. And it happened after years and years of advocacy and calls to action from civil societies for the international community to finally, finally create a new uh, flexible financing mechanism that really uh, goes and looks for and untaps the full potential of women in building peace and respond to crisis. So we are a multi-partner trust fund. We involve everyone, the member states, the donors, the civil society organizations like yours, but also international organizations um, and um, you know, the private sector, individuals, um, and we involve um, everybody to support those uh, women leaders. So uh, beyond the examples that you have shared on in the Philippines, we also support, for example, women's organizations in Iraq who are providing psychosocial support to women in ISIS liberated territories. In Colombia, for example, we would partner with local women's organizations who would work on the implementation of the peace agreement. Um, in Ukraine, uh, more recently, we're supporting local women's organizations who are uh, working with the women and girls who are displaced by the war uh, inside the country, but also in neighboring countries such, uh, such as Moldova. So these are just a few examples uh, of the type of organizations and work that we, we fund. And I'm very proud to share that uh, so far, since we established this fund in, in 2016, it's more than 600 uh, civil society organizations uh, that we have uh, supported in more than, than 28 countries um, across the world. Um, but maybe uh, I'd like to pause here, if you don't mind, and ask a question to you as the expert in, on this topic. Um, can you share also in your perspective why you think that it is so crucial for women like yourself to actively participate specifically in peace processes and the implementation of peace agreements uh, in, the in the Philippines and, and around the world? Uh, can you tell us just a little bit more about, about your experience? Uh, we, re we really see that peace is more sustainable with women being involved and more holistic. Um, you know, in the Philippines, we have the distinction of having the first uh, woman who chairing a peace negotiation to sign the peace agreement. But uh, she was appointed by a woman uh, peace advisor. So women uh, helping to bring in and appoint, have other women appointed to position. and. Um, it was, they had a tough negotiation. If you see in the peace agreement, uh, women and gender is not so much in every page of the agreement, but they were able to negotiate important language that um, you know, enshrined the uh, meaningful participation of women um, in, the, in the Bangsamoro. So that was there in the rest of the agreement and eventually in the law that was created. So it talks about gender and development and even talks about a gender budget for the Bangamoro region. So these are the kinds of negotiations that women are able to do. I'm also in a body called, um, uh, it's an independent body called the third party monitoring team uh, looking at the implementation of this agreement on the Bangamoro. So I'm one woman out of a team of five um, and well, sometimes the, the men also ask a few questions about the women, but t the tendency is it's really up to me to try to ask for more meetings with women's organizations, to ask the numbers and the, the quality of the services that are being provided to women. Uh, another issue that we're concerned about and we're supporting is the transitional justice and reconciliation. This is again in the Bangsamoro. And um, it's not moving much actually, although it has been agreed on. Uh, so women are pushing for it, but also they, uh, they're giving their agenda, what, they, what to them is their right to truth, uh, what to women is justice and reparation, and what would be non-recurrence of 
uh, human rights abuses. So they have, uh, women, through consultations, women have developed their agenda for uh, peace and justice. So these are just some of the things, but it was uh, nice to know about so many other projects and we hope we can have exchanges later. Um, because there's really this difficulty for most women's organizations to access uh, flexible and, you know, quality financing. So maybe you could still tell me a little bit more of what makes um, the Women Peace Humanitarian Fund different in, in helping women's organizations to access such funding. Yeah, thank you so much, Karen. I think what you just said really illustrates really well how when women get together and use their resources to advocate, they can really uh, hold um, governments and other parties accountable uh, and seek social uh, justice. And it's, it's very, uh, very interesting. Uh, and thank you for your question. So I would say that one thing that we're doing differently um, and of which I'm actually particularly proud is that almost half of the organizations that we support are receiving money from the UN for the first time. Uh, so this is really something that we made our mission to ensure that we reach beyond the uh, usual suspects uh, and channel support to where it's really urgently needed. And that's made possible through a variety of, of um, you know, kind of um, actions such as uh, streamlined funding application processes, um, made accessible in a wide range of languages, a smaller grant size, simplified reporting requirements, to just name a few of the measures that we've put in place. Um, and in that kind of framework, um, another thing that, that is also very specific to us is that we are first and foremost a localization tool. So we localize the sustaining peace agenda, we localize the SDGs, and over 70% of the projects that we fund are implemented at the sub-national level, so local or grassroots. Um, and these are really, as you know, organizations that are supporting women and populations in areas where services are often disrupted or even non-existent. And they bring deep structural uh, change and, and address the underlying causes of, of conflict and inequality. Um, but beyond the funding, because we don't provide only funding, and you were mentioning how important it is uh, for you to be able to exchange experiences also with other women's organizations across the world, we also do work to enhance their institutional capacity to make them stronger as organizations. So we have dedicated institutional funding, for example, available to local organizations. So we allow them to help cover their basic uh, operational needs and expenses, such as staff cost, technology, uh, sometimes just rent. Um, and these are really central for organizations uh, like yours, especially in crisis contexts where oper operations are, are a bit difficult. We also have a global learning hub that help us to connect uh, the organizations such as your, yours to others uh, throughout the world and to be able to share experiences, knowledge, best practices, because we acknowledge these organizations as the leading experts uh, on, 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 the, on the matter. So we really want that knowledge to, to serve others uh, in other countries. Um, but beyond the financing and the capacity building, we also help uh, amplify the voices of the women leaders. Um, we all know, as I just mentioned, that women leaders have unique expertise, knowledge, experience, uh, and we leverage our access to you and system and colleagues to connect them with global forums, such as the Security Council, or even the SDG Action, Action Zone today, and support them to speak their truth in the halls of power, so, so to speak, and give them a chance to shape policy at the global level. So that's really also central uh, for us. But I, I, let, me, let me also stop here and ask, um, from your own experience, why are local women's civil society organizations so essential to, to building peace? And also we're here today at the SDG Action Zone, uh, which is an influential uh, global platform. What is, according to you, the most important message that you would have? <laughs> well, on local women's organizations, we really believe they're important. So we try to do a lot of networking among them. And, um, you know, even if we have national action plans, uh, they sort of fall by the wayside somehow. If there are no women's organizations locally who will call the, the local government officials to account and remind them that this is the agenda, this is what we want, this is the kind of peace that we are really pushing for. So 
that that role of women on the ground is really uh, very crucial. Um, well, for you know, it's very good to hear about this SDG action zone. <laughs> um, thinking of my message, um, maybe I have to because I cannot help but think that you know, in the world now today, we you know we can have these goals and do this, um, which are very good and concrete. But one important thing really is to uh, end the conflicts, end the wars, you know, have ceasefire because they're really um, affecting women, their survival, et cetera. And we can see that in, in many cases. Uh, but the other thing is that really um, uh, to, to co continue to listen to the voices of women, uh, but uh, think of them not as victims because they're not just the victims, they're also the the resources, they, they are the peacemakers, they're the peace builders, so they can do so much to really make this into a more sustainable world. So I think that's what I would want to say. And uh, let me know also what your message would be to the international community since you're, you see the broad <laughs> arena of what women's organizations are doing in different parts of the world. Thank you, Karen. I think I we strongly believe also in the power of, of women as, as agent of change uh, in all of these uh, these aspects of, of, of the work. So I think this is something that we definitely uh, align with. And this is also a part of the of the message. I think the, the final maybe key message that I would have is that everybody has a role to play in supporting women's organization who respond to, to crisis and build peace. Uh, it's not only for governments, but also for parliaments, for civil society, companies, foundations, but also individuals like uh, all of us. Uh, we all can do something to support this work. Uh, this is why the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund created a campaign that we, we launched, uh, which is called the 1000 Women Leaders Campaign and aims at supporting uh, 1000 uh, women leaders and the organizations by the end of 2025. Uh, so I would encourage everybody to visit the website uh, wphfund.org slash 1000 women leaders and join us in this global movement to support women and their work for peace and crisis response. Thank you again, Karen. And thank you all of you for thank joining you. us today. Thank you.